church family. Um, glad to have you guys here worshiping with us on Christmas Eve. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sing a few songs to our Lord and just, um, yeah, celebrate his soon-to-be arrival. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, oh, come, ye, oh, come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels, oh, come, let us adore excited to have you here with us as we celebrate during our Christmas Eve service. We are uh, wanting to make sure that during this Advent season, we pause for each Sunday leading up to the birth of Jesus. And today we celebrate uh, his birth. We know that it'll take place tomorrow for you while you're at home and worshiping in your home, but we wanted to do it corporately as, as a family. And so we are delighted that you are here. Uh, for the family that has been trekking with us uh, there through this month or through the years. It's so good to be with you guys connected. Uh, but even if you're a visitor or you're new, we're happy that you have uh, joined us for this worship experience. Speaking of worship, uh, we have some young voices that would like to, to worship in their own way. They have put together something that we think will be a, a blessing to you. Take a moment to listen. My tale wandered twenty. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Um and all went back in register to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. 
While they were there, the time came for her to have birth. She gave birth to a firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, "Do not be afraid, for behold, for behold, I bring you, I bring you good, good news, news of a great joy." Which will be for all the people. On to you. He was born this day. On this day. In the city of David. In the city of David. A savior. A savior. Who is Christ the Lord? Who is Christ the Lord? And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in a swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel. A multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, "Glory to the God in the highest, and on earth peace with those with whom He is pleased." When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, "Let us go into Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened." Which the Lord has made known to us, and they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for what I have heard and seen, and what I have been told. Man, it's great to have our kids uh, worshiping the Lord during this Christmas in their in their own ways, and they're so so cute, y'all. Let's let's pray for them. Lord, we're thankful for. Uh, for the children, thankful for the kids. We pray, Lord, that the scriptures that they memorized, that they read, that they were practicing, Lord, are, are being just planted in their hearts. And that, Lord, they will forever be remembering this story of you coming to dwell with us. May we learn from them and have a, a, a beautiful faith that reflects you, but let their faith even start now as their own. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Speaking of kids, family, uh, I have had the blessing of having a variety of children. I uh, got, got, got some beautiful kids, and it's crazy to see how kids approach things differently. It could be the, the same event but how children approach it can be very, very different. My children can both see a swing and one child sees the swing, heads for it and says, man, this swing is going to be a place where I can find a comfortable position, lock my arms in and then move at a pace where I can gently feel that breeze just on my face, enjoying a swing. While another one of my children can see a swing and be like, man, I can't wait to get my feet pumping so I can move to a height where this swing can launch me for about three seconds and I can feel like I'm flying. This swing can be a catapult. Same swing, but just looked at very, very differently. I see it happen with, with adults as well. A, a, a gift can be given, right? 
a, a, a car can be given to a, a couple who was needing a car and one spouse says, wow, this is going to be a blessing. It's going to allow us to get to A to B, the freedom that we now have to come and go as we please. We don't have to worry about the bus. We can get bigger things and the joy that that can seemingly bring, the happiness that comes from that gift. But the other person can say, oh, wait a minute. With this gift, where are we going to get the ability to pay the insurance? How are we going to maintain it? Can we even afford the gas? All of these worries. You see, sometimes one situation can have a variety of ways that we look at it. Matthew chapter 2 brings us into this, this Christmas story. But there's going to be a situation that takes place and multiple people are going to respond to the same situation. Very, very different. If you will read with me, we're going to look at Matthew chapter two and we're going to read the 12 verses. And the Lord's going to give us some lessons today from it. Verse one, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Then Herod called called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, Report to me so that I, too, may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Again, verses one and two. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. There are some terms that are very familiar with this story, but it can get a little bit confusing amongst Christians because we use different terms to describe this crew, the Magi. The Magi is a, is, is a, Magi is a Greek word that refers to uh, the stars. It refers to, to astrology. It refers to, to folks that would study the stars and interpret them. They would, they would allow their life to be dictated by signs and responses that they thought the heavens were communicating. So constellations would, would mean a lot to them and stars would mean a lot to them. And so they would find certain understanding in the sky. So, yeah, when you think of the term magi, you're thinking of somebody that that dabbles a bit in astrology. They wouldn't say that they worship it. They would say that they use it as a means to affect how they live. But also the term magician would come from this this root magi as well. So out the gate, we've got a group of people that don't seem to fit the typical Christian mold. The chapter opens with with folks that interpret stars and it's easy to be like, okay, we're talking about the birth of Jesus, talking about the Christ. How does it open like this? But I'll be quick to tell you that God can show up in some unlikely places. If you do just a a Google search or you ask your friends, hey, have you have you seen God in unlikely places? You'll get some really 
really interesting and yet amazing stories. Some folks have been have been uh, connected with God and felt like they they loved him and were able to know him after the midst of a painful breakup. There's been some that have, have come to know God after they were chasing money and after their greed led them down tunnels and alleys that seemed like dead ends and they connect with God. I was reading an article by a guy that that mentioned he went to watch a movie about a that was based on a true story about a a team whose plane had crashed into a mountain. And you know how in movies, sometimes the movie will start with the ending and then the rest of the movie helps you understand how they got to that point. Well, in the first couple minutes of the movie, the guys, they say, hey, how did you how did you guys survive? And the person says in the first couple minutes that we felt the presence of God. This person writing the article said that mere statement while in a movie theater kicking it with somebody thinking about something totally different, that mere statement stuck with them for years to come and God would keep sending kind of a a watering of that seed to show that person that his presence was real and ultimately they ended up accepting Christ. Getting kind of pricked in a movie theater, seeing God in some some unlikely places. My 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 lovely wife had taken some courses where she wanted to understand uh, the Muslim faith, understand that uh, Islam and how to uh, engage with people uh, from that faith. And so it was quite uh, amazing to me when she was reading books. And these books had testimonies of Christians that once were Muslims, but Christians that would say during their times of prayer, God came and spoke to them. Yahweh, Elohim, our our Lord and Savior came and met them where they were kind of connected in an unlikely place and grabbed their heart. So, yeah, these these magis uh, are, are, are a bit of the unconventional person that you would expect. They don't come in prim and proper. They come in a bit rough. They come in representing kind of a, a Persian influence. And so they are sometimes referred to as three kings. But we don't know if they were kings or not. We know that they were people of influence. We know that they had stature. And we say three because they presented three gifts. But you and I know if you got a long journey and you're going to be rolling through some hood of hoods, you probably are rolling deep. So we think that actually these these magi had a whole entourage with them. But maybe those three were the ones that actually went in and connected with Christ. We're not sure. What we are sure, though, is that God used star. He used his creation. He used astrology to to grab them and draw them closer. But their experience of even a miraculous star was not enough. You see, that experience was could could not validate things alone. They 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 saw this star and they responded. But they had to get some type of of validation. I ask a question though. If if the Magi saw something and it led them to respond, the Magi saw this 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 star and led them to respond, what would lead you to respond? Maybe in a, a lifestyle of worship, but but it's interesting around Christmas time we start seeing some 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 responses take place that are more responses of happiness, right? You see spouses and marriages where people have been unkind to each other all year and then they buy a nice gift with a big bow on it, present something expensive, and all of a sudden it just makes for happy times, right? Happy responses. Or or folks have been counting down to 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 hoping that this 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 government will work things out and 
people are in need. And so they're like, please, would y'all get this in, in order so we can get these checks? And finally, these checks are seeming like they're going to arrive, these stimulus checks, and people are starting to get smile and get, get happy and respond and, and have some actions that seem to, to follow some of this stimulus. We're seeing people have some happy feelings. See, this just, was, this just wasn't happiness. This just wasn't like a, 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 quick, scent, a quick snip of delight for, for, these, for these magi. They came to worship. A, a miracle had taken place. It might have been somewhat normal to them to, to see stars and signs, but they knew this star was, was different. This star was something that, that led them not to just simply send a gift. They didn't just send a gift acknowledging that a royal birth took place. They didn't just send a, a pack of swaddling cloth onesies. They didn't send just a, a crib bumper made out of hay. They didn't just send a, a gift card to a few nights at the end. They said, no, we go on ourselves. We gonna pack up the gift that we send. We will be delivering. We're heading to worship. This wasn't just a, a, a birth of royalty. This was the birth. And they said, we will go and worship ourselves. So they went and they went and they went for a trip that might have been upwards of two years. But their purpose was one of worship and to worship the king and nothing would get in their way. They went to worship a king and nothing would get in their way except maybe a king. Look with me at verse three. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler. He will shepherd my people, Israel. Herod now, this this king, he started off rather good. Actually, Herod was was not an Israelite himself, but Herod was the king of the people of Israel. He created some jobs for the working class. Initially, he built up and and extended the temple. He even married a Jewish woman. So Herod seemed down, but then Herod made a, a shift. Herod started feeling threatened by all people. Herod started taking the lives of people. Not even his family was safe. They said that one of his wives' lives was taken by him. And the Magi come seeking to find the king in the midst of Herod in all of this craziness. And those in Jerusalem know that Herod is a bad, wild boy, so everybody has the potential for being disturbed. But the Magi are coming to confirm what they have seen. And so they approach Herod, and Herod does what everybody else do. He, he make a phone call. Herod dials in a lifeline. Herod sends a text to his religious crew, his religious crew of wisdom, and says, hey, I, 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 I need y'all to come validate something. And church, Mac family, those listening, don't miss this key point. That even though God spoke through astrology and in no way are we saying astrology is the way to Jesus. No, what we're saying is God can use anything to draw men to him. And, and even though that God spoke through this, the use of this star. It had to align with God's word. The experience of the Magi and what was revealed to them 
had to align with what was said in God's word. The Africa Bible commentary says it like this. It says, we may infer that any extra revelations in the forms of words, pictures, dreams, visions, and prophecies are are only partial and must all conform to the revealed word of God as contained in the Old and New Testaments. Layman's terms, you can have an experience, but it's got to line up with what thus says the Lord. And I just a good dream isn't enough. The star alone wasn't enough. They needed confirmation and they went to Herod to find out where they would get that confirmation. And Herod says, let me go to the people who know who can confirm it. Let me go to the crew that knows the word. Let me get the chief priests. Now enter the chief priests and the teachers. Verse four, and when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. Now, now the chief priest is a crew. All right. Now we got magi seeming like astrologers, uh, Persian crew. Uh, They probably coming in, you know, when they come to worship and show up on a scene, they probably got like hammer pants on, starter jackets and some skull caps. You know what I'm saying? Maybe some baseball bats just in case while they travel and they get into some dirt, they ready to handle their business. They coming in like, okay, let's let's see what these homies are about. Herod, you know, he king royalty dapped out, got the long flowing robe. You see him in the streets, you know, he is money and he is power and he is influence. And then you probably got the 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 chief priests, teachers that look kind of like me. I mean, just from my suit, you expect me to do something that that is structured and organized. And this is what the chief priests are from the age of five. These children were set aside and started memorizing and learning scripture. They started to to dig deep in the in the scriptures and they were given a rabbi to study under. And for the next 25 years, they would be groomed. Groomed refined until they themselves became a rabbi. They they would be like what we would call the 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 Google or the Alexa of the Bible. You needed to know something. You'd be like, hey, chief priest. Can you tell me, like, what's the first five books of the Bible? Oh, we got you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, like they they would they would just let it flow. You know what I'm saying? Like they would just they would just let it. They would just let it. I only said four. Deuteronomy next. Uh, you, you, this, this is what they they knew the scriptures in and out. So simply put, Herod asked them about this king because they had the book which had the answer. He knew that if anybody would know about this king to be born. That would be a threat to his kingdom that could validate what the Magi have experienced. It would be the chief priest. One of the beautiful aspects of of Christianity is the truth that that our reality is is laid out right in front of us and in a book. It's a dangerous reality, though, right? It's one that is so counter. I mean, Jonathan preached a little bit more than a week and a half ago, and he, and he, he encouraged us about how the Bible reveals this, this upside down manner in which the kingdom operates, that the, that the first shall be last, or, or as he put it, that we disadvantage ourselves to advantage our neighbors. We define our lives by losing them. That's why certain countries and governments throughout time have outlawed the Bible Because it is a story, a true story about love, about joy, about peace and about hope. And if you believe what it says and actually take it at face value that the prophecies and all the truths that are within it will come to pass. You'll be proven correct. 
and you'll experience a freedom that no regime and no government can deny. So we have this event that takes place. It's the, 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 the coming birth of this, of this child, the, the, the birth of this king, and the magi see it and view it in one way where they are willing to stop their lives and say, we are going to go worship ourselves. Herod sees it another way. He sees it as a threat to his kingdom. And then we have the chief priests who validate it all, and they see it another way. And let's see how the chief priests respond. Look with me, verses Seven through nine. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And as soon as you find him, report to me so that I, too, may go and worship him. And after they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. What just happened to the chief priests? The folks who who know the Bible the most, what, what just happened to them? They exit stage left. We don't see them as the vital part of the story anymore. Why? Because they failed to act. When God enters your life and reveals something to you, it demands a response. It demands a response. And 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 I know that some people may be tuning in, or may be with us, that this is your first time hearing these words or coming to understand what the gospel is and even what this story is. But for a second, I want to just speak to my people who've been in the faith for for a bit. Some of my older folks in the faith, those that hear the Bible stories and the stories seem So familiar that you already know exactly what God wants. You already know exactly what God expects. And the familiarity can sometimes seduce us into an apathetic Christian life. Not that any of us would ever reject scripture or any theological concept, but that you would cease to be stirred to action. And that's a dangerous place to be. George MacDonald, the writer who influenced greatly C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and so many more. He said, all growth that is not toward God is growing to decay. Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged us in another way. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He says, your life begins to end the moment you start being silent about the things that matter. That which matters. The birth of the king of kings mattered and the chief priests confirmed it and did nothing. They did not act. They did not respond. And so they are almost Exited out the story. Church family, don't let that be my, your, our reality where we get in our comfortable times of 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 swinging back and forth. And sometimes we need to be willing to jump and take some leaps of faith based on responses that we see God expecting of us as we've been diving in his word. Let's not let's not let Christian apathy seep in. So Herod sends the Magi on their way with the hopes that that they will report back to him. And so he can come and and find this child and and celebrate and worship with them. No, he's coming to kill the threat. His hope is to eliminate the threat to the throne. So continue with me on in verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. 
when they opened their treasures and presented him with the gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The miraculous continues. This star that must have stopped when they were, when the Magi were talking with Herod somehow begins to lead them again. And I, and I, and I love that, the, that, that, that we get this picture of three things. The African Bible, Africa Bible commentary says that three things take place in the, in the response, in the posture of the Magi. First thing, they were overjoyed. That, that, that they thought once we get to the king, we'll find it. We'll be there. We're good. But see, that was, that was, that was one stop on the journey. God led them to the king for a purpose. But that was not the final destination. And so they find great joy when God continues to lead them to the Christ. They were, they were following in line with what had happened so many times throughout history. You remember Solomon? Solomon had a, uh, a there's another gentleman, I think it was Abijah. Oh my goodness, it's in uh, 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 40. Uh, uh, re shares this account and I'm trying to remember if it's a Abijah or my Lord. Um, but but what what happens in the situation though is that that there's this threat to take the to take Solomon's place, to take his 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 uh his position as the next king behind David. And David says, no, 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 that ain't going down. I got it. I'll make sure it happens. He makes sure Solomon gets placed next as the king has him anointed, he becomes king. And then they say what happens is the people rejoice with such a loud manner that the ground starts shaking. You know, like, like when your football team wins and you start stumping on the ground and at the game, you know, like, like there is so much rejoicing that the king is now in his rightful place. It was a, an overjoyed experience. That's what happens to the Magi. They rejoice and are, are overjoyed that they've found the king. Second, if, if first they were overjoyed, second, they bow down before this baby. This is off because these are three, three wise men. These are magi. These are the three kings. These are men of influence. People come to them and bow. And now we see, as J.D. said, flipped. And those of stature, those of influence, bowing down. Why? Because they're showing a, a, a posture of humility. This is what you do before royalty. This is what you do when you recognize that you submit to one that is greater. And so they enter into his presence and they, they bow down and, and their, their wealth, their influence is all moved to the side. They were overjoyed, humble. And lastly, they were generous. They came giving gifts. And while, while the, the meaning of these gifts and their significance is all will be debated and has been debated for years and will be debated, what we do know is frankincense, incense, and myrrh was costly, extremely valuable. It was something that, that they didn't just grab here and there and go to the Dollar Tree and offer up a couple quick gifts. These were things that were of great value. It was a sign of their reverence for Jesus Christ. The sign of them understanding the importance of who he was and that they wanted to give something that was costly of great price. We saw them respond with joy, 
Respond with humility. Respond with generosity. Family, don't you see us all in this story? Don't you see the the temptation to be maybe Herod where you might not want to let go of some of the things you are grasping at and controlling in your life and you don't want Christ to fully reign? Don't you see the temptation to be a, a, a teacher or a chief priest, someone that can go through life without ruffling feathers, finding yourself in comfortable positions where you're a part of the status quo? But worship that would interrupt your lifestyle and lead you to behave in ways that are different. You see those temptations? But you also see kind of the, 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 the least of these, not in the sense of, 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 of financial gain and financial worth, but least of these in the sense of the last person you expect. That of the uh, astrologers, the folk that might have seen a little weird, are the ones who actually model a posture of worship. See, I'm I'm grateful that God can use the unlikely to grab us. Let's not say can, let's say he did because he called an unlikely people to himself. It was us who were far off that he drew to himself. But it started not at the cross. Thank the Lord. Hallelujah. We're thankful that it ended at the cross, but it started with his birth. With him coming fully God to dwell among man. And every year you and I get a chance to look at this story again and again and say, Lord, how will I respond? How will I respond to the way you have broken into time and what you have done for me. Don't let me get comfortable with the story of you changing time forever. Don't let me get comfortable with the story that shows us the start of a new kingdom that is entering into our world. Don't let me get comfortable with the story of a time when we were dark and you brought light to us. Family, my prayer is that we would dig deeper in Christ and that we would approach him with a joy, a humility, a generosity that's not only allowed, but is expected when we worship. If you're a person that is saying, I hear that for the people who are walking with Jesus, that that they would experience joy growing that and humility and growing that and generosity, giving of their 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 treasures. But I'm just now learning. That I should not be in charge of my life, but this God who you have been talking about, Pastor Leon, should be the one in charge. If you are saying today. I want to give my life to Jesus Because I believe, like the Magi, he's worthy of worship, of me giving of myself to make his name great. If you believe that, we ask you simply pray this prayer. Lord, I believe you. I believe that I need you. I believe that I have sinned. And that you died so that I could live. Jesus, we be, I'm thankful for you. I ask for forgiveness. And I want to live for you by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, it starts with Jesus coming as a babe, but it ends temporarily at the cross with Jesus taking all of our sin all of our guilt, all of our shame. He is nailed to the cross and we are forgiven and get to start in a new relationship and a new covenant with God. And I said temporarily because it seems like 
at the cross is where things end. But no, the cross is 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 a is the culmination of Christ's journey. But Christ conquers death and continues to live at the right hand of the father. And so we as his kingdom people follow Christ, not only because he died, but also because he lives. And so we're grateful that every Advent we get a glimpse into the future of living forever because we are know that the light of the world entered into our reality. We celebrate it every year. Church family, we have been celebrating aspects of that story. We've been using the Advent wreath to do that. We have been uh, lighting each week a candle. And so now I want to ask you to grab your uh, responsive readings. Grab what we have given you. Family, if you are uh, with us and don't have it, it's going to be on the screen. It's going to be a, a responsive reading that takes place at this time. Uh, and we ask that you grab your Advent reefs uh, as we respond and read and engage together. In the season of Advent, we have used the Advent wreath and its candles to focus our minds on the truth that Christ will return in glory and to help us get ready for his great celebration of the birth of Christ, the light of the world. Today, we light all the candles of the Advent wreath. We light the candle for the love because Jesus is God's love incarnate. We light the candle for joy because Jesus brings everlasting joy. We light the candle for peace because Jesus is our Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. We light the candle for hope because Jesus is our ultimate source of hope. Lastly, we will light the Christ candle as we celebrate the wonderful reality that Jesus the Christ, the light of the world, our glorious redeeming Savior is born. Please light all five of your candles at this time. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. 
He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. And greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. And together, as we remember Christ's birth, and anticipate Christ's glorious return. May God fill our hearts with his light and life. Amen, amen. Family, we would typically be together and take this center candle and connect it to each one of you to light candles throughout the sanctuary to remind us that the only way that we have light is because we have the light of Christ dwelling within us. And so even though I can't give you uh, uh, the ability to light off the candle, what I can give you is the ability to sing out to God and join your family who may be in other places, but still can be in unison during this time, singing unto God. Will you join us as we sing joy to the world? Let's go ahead and celebrate the coming of the King by singing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. In heaven and nature see, in heaven and nature see. worshiping as a family tomorrow. Uh, Thank you, worship team, for leading us in in song today. Uh, We pray that you will be able to uh, celebrate the birth of our Savior, uh, and we pray uh, that it will spur you on to responding in worship. Uh, The next time we see you, we'll be able to say uh, Merry Christmas. Uh, We know that that's coming tomorrow, but uh, have a great time, family. We love you and look forward to seeing you again. God bless. Go in peace.